Hello and welcome back to Elder Sign, a weird fiction podcast by Clay Temple Media. I'm Glenn McDorman. And I'm Brandon Buddha. This episode, we're talking about the Arthur Mackin story, Out of the Earth, originally published in the newspaper TP's Weekly in November 1915. So this is now the third story that was selected by our Patreon supporters. And so before we get into this one, we do just want to take a moment to remind people how that story selection process is going to work. So we're going to hold votes to decide what we cover on Elder Sign at the end of every odd numbered month. And we will always send out the email on the 20th of the month or a little bit before. So if you have not seen it by the 21st, you should check your promotions tab on Gmail or your your spam folder to, to find it. And if it's not there, you can let us know. You can email us directly or contact us on Patreon. We'll make sure that you you get the link to the vote. So as this episode airs, we are just only a few days from opening up the July vote. So if you aren't already a Patreon supporter at the Archon level or above, you can do that right now and you can vote on this next batch of stories. This next ballot has a lot of great stories on it. It's probably going to be a pretty tight vote. We're going to be including you know authors like Edgar Allan Poe and Clark Ashton Smith and Thomas Ligotti. And also on the ballot will be the next story in the Robert W. Chambers collection from the King in Yellow. Previously, we did the first story, The Repair of Reputations. Yeah, I mean, if we had to vote on this, I don't know which of those I would pick. You only get to pick three of the the eight that are on there. And frankly, I'm glad that we don't have to pick. In fact, we have Patreon supporters who are going to do that hard work for us. Right. Well, all right. Let's uh, let's turn our attention to this story that we're doing tonight, Out of the Earth by Arthur Mackin. It's really only been a few episodes since we covered his story, The Bowman, and that is going to turn out to be relevant here as well, as this is another story that Mackin wrote during the first year of the, the First World War, and it's very much about that, as we will see in the discussion for sure. So I think with that, let's let's get into it, Brandon. Take us through the plot of this story. Yeah, I'll do the best I can. There, there's a lot of connected words in this story, but the plot might be hard to identify as we go through the recap. I'm going to try to keep us uh, as close to the story as possible to give everybody a sense of how the story is written. The narrator of Out of the Earth is none other than Arthur Mackin himself. As he is writing this story, he is living through the fallout of having written the immensely popular and even we'd call it viral story, The Bowmen. And in light of having created what amounts to an urban legend, Arthur Mackin is sympathetic to the sorts of strange reports that are coming out of various places around the UK. He's heard some confused complaints coming out of certain Welsh watering places, for instance, about the ill behavior of children. And these rumors originated last August. Mackin has been receiving a lot of mail, both from fans and would-be abusers, because of the thoughtless bit of prose, as he sort of has come to characterize it, he put into print in the evening news, The Bowman. Because of The Bowman uh, and The Angel of Mons and the gossip surrounding the story, Mackin wants to be careful in the telling of a new story. The Bowman had grown far beyond his control, especially when the daughter of a well-known canon allegedly testified to seeing these angels, though she later denied all knowledge of the matter. It's almost as if Mackin is apologizing for writing The Bowman in the opening of this story, and now he, again, is trying to be more careful in his reporting of strange events. He only wants to write about what he can be precise about. And he wants to use this new approach to his writing to tell his audience of the strange rumors passed around in letters between travelers and in these Welsh watering places regarding, again, the misbehavior of children in Welsh villages. I know I'm sounding repetitive here, but this is how the story opens. There's a lot of repetition of these. uh, There's a lot of repetition of this strange event or rumors of the strange event really to keep the reader engaged with what Mackin is doing here in the story. Right. For for something that is meant to be a, a newspaper op-ed piece about current events, there's not a real clear 
thesis statement or even a clear topic sentence, actually, in the first page and a half of this story, or maybe really anywhere in this story. And I think that's part of what Mackin is doing, because even though none of that is clear, we still aren't really sure what he's even talking about. There is some really masterful page turner storytelling at the beginning of the story. It's really a a series of teases that make us ask questions and beg Mackin to give us the answers. And we'll keep turning the page until he does. And one of his techniques here is that he presumes that his readers are familiar with the news item that he is going to be talking about. And so he just alludes to it, right? So he assumes that we have knowledge of this thing, even though none of us possibly can, because he's making it all up. There is no news item. And so every single reader is going to be is getting me feel like they are somehow ill-informed that they have missed something and feel this urge to to find out uh, you know if you're reading a newspaper right so that's just masterful storytelling and on top of this he's now playing a, a kind of trick on his audience because as you say brandon the story opens with this insistence that the story of the angels of the mons is fictional that it's based on his story the bowman and he even gives us some details of this negative response right this like hate mail that he's getting Basically, it's the first instance of internet comments, actually, is what it sounds like. And he uses that experience to lay claim to an authority on rumor and the circulation of false stories in order to trick people into believing the rumor that he's going to make up in this story. And I think this is an absolutely brilliant move, right? He's like trolling his own critics now, right? Trolling the people who send him all this hate mail. And I love that he is able to channel his frustrating experience with the Bowman into something fun and and also presumably, you know, some pay for him. Right. Mackin is clearly having a lot of fun with the readers of the Bowman and the whole... and the. And the way that that story has caught fire across all of England in the in the wake of the beginning of World War One, and I think this method is hilarious. I'm not quite sure that he pulls it off in this story because he spills so much ink on the fact that the Bowman is fake and he's not going to do that again. He's not going to start a new rumor and he's going to be really careful. So it really takes us to the almost the last page of the story to understand what the plot of this story is. And I'm not sure we're ever really going to know actually in the story, but I think on that note, we should get back to trying to suss out what is going on here, what the actual plot is. One thing that Mackin is trying to do is, is track down the reason for the rumors. And he thinks that part of the reason just off the top of his head before he really investigates these rumors is that a lot of folks who normally travel to the East for holidays were unable to do so uh, during this holiday season due to air raids taking place. And so many people have traveled West to the first time to Wales and the folks in the East who perhaps relied on tourism for income have begun to circulate nasty rumors about whales to stem the tide of travelers going in that direction. But Mackin really can't be sure why the rumor started, but he does have a personal connection to the way these rumors have spread. One day while he's eating lunch at a Fleet Street Tavern, a friend of his, a solicitor named Edis, comes and joins him. The lawyer asks Mackin where he would be taking his holidays, and Mackin responds that he would be going to the place he always goes, Monavan in Wales. His friend is astonished that Mackin would go back there because he's heard through his wife, who heard it through a friend of hers, maybe a clergyman, but it could be a different friend than that, that the place has, quote, gone off. Mackin doesn't understand this because the Manavan ought to be untouched by the troubles of war, unless it has been overtaken by tourists. But Mackin really can't imagine that this is the case either because Manavan isn't exactly easy to get to, and it's a pretty boring, solitary place anyway. His friend Edis continues, Edis's wife heard now from a clergyman that the neighboring town's beach, the neighboring town to Manavan, has been overrun by misbehaved children, and these children use bad language and run amok. They speak worse than the children in London slum. Mackin hears some more about the seaside Welsh towns and the children that have overrun them, and it simply does not match up with his own experiences. And he can't even understand Edis's motivation in telling him this rumor. 
Uh, but that is not the last thing that Mackin has heard about the children in Wales. After he hears this first rumor from his friend, he finds rumors are continuing to swirl around these evil children. No one has any direct connection to these events. But by the by, the rumors eventually get big enough that they make it into the newspaper. And Mackin here now begins to wonder if the public mind has just been unhinged by the ongoing war. One of the elements of this story is that English people are having to go to Wales to take their regular holidays because the war is disrupting them. And I think there's something doubly snide in the way that Mackin is reporting that. For for one, uh, tens of thousands of people are in a horrific shooting war with each other, uh, not very far from here, and don't get to take a vacation from that at all. And so I think Mackin is... Uh, pointing out that uh, that these people, these upper middle class people who are complaining about where they have to take their vacation are uh, having no empathy or sympathy for the soldiers who are fighting in their name on their behalf in France and Belgium right now. But also, uh, this is an insult to Mackin's homeland, to Wales. So it's only the second, it's like the second best, or maybe not even the second best at all, like the 10th best vacation place. We're only going there because we're not allowed to go to the place we actually want to go on vacation. Vacation. And Mackin turns around and, and writes about the, the Welsh countryside with a, a real profound patriotism. And I just want to read one of these descriptions because I thought it was really uh, just tremendously beautiful. So Mackin writes, I knew Castle Coke well, a little bay bastioned by dunes and red sandstone cliffs, rich with greenery. A stream of cold water runs down there to the sea. There is the ruined Norman Castle, the ancient church and the scattered village. It is altogether a place of peace and quiet and great beauty. And this is just a, a vivid description, but I also just love his use of adjectives here, especially the description of the Norman Castle, not as being in ruins, but as being ruined. And I should say, too, that, that Castle Coke is a, a real place. It's near Cardiff, and uh, people like to, to get married there. There's a big backlog if that's where you would like to have your wedding. But that's not actually the place that Mackin is describing here. Uh, and in fact, Mackin is intentionally confusing and mixing up Welsh geography here, uh, perhaps actually to make sure that no one suffers from uh, more readers who don't realize that this is fiction, right? And, and sort of starts showing up in the actual places he's describing, sort of demanding to, to see the weird things that he's about to to hint at, allude to, without actually telling us about. Yeah, he continues to tell us the story of how rumors grow. I mean, maybe that's the main theme of this story, if not the plot. The rumors here about these children continue to escalate. People begin to tell stories of visitors children to the welsh seaside being beaten or tortured by these other little children one boy had been found impaled on a stake while another had been lured to his death over the cliffs at castle coke one london publication who had probably had enough of these rumors actually just sends a journalist to arfon to investigate when the journalist came back a week later, he declares that there was no truth to be found in these rumors. Everyone, including the children, had been pleasant and kind. Megan has a really great bit here about the way in which these rumors got into the news, and not just factual news reporting, but the, the op-ed pieces of the day, and the unruly behavior of children in very small Welsh villages, uh, you know, in July of 1915, becomes wrapped up in a number of, of political uh, topics, hot topics of the day as well, including the, the issue of the Welsh uh, mining strikes, something that, that Churchill was involved in, also the question of whether the, the Church of Wales, the state-run uh, Church of Wales, should be disestablished, uh, and there are a number of other political things here. And you know, this story opens with Magan complaining about people who write comments on the internet, and now it seems like he's complaining about people who turn every bit of news, even made-up news, into an issue of political ideology. Right? These unruly kids can't possibly have anything to do with whether the Church of Wales should be, you know, disestablished or not. 
And you just have to have a real chip on your shoulder. You have to be a real grumpus to take a story like that and make it about your thing that you, the thing that you like to complain about with the state of the world today. And I think Macken's having some fun about that. He is. Not only is he going after internet commenters, but he's also going after the 24 hour news cycle that we kind of live in today, where everything has to be a talking point. Everything that is reported has to be tied to some political, ideological issue. Or else it's not worth reporting on. And, and that's a, a massive problem. And we've seen news fads sweep through the news channels we watch today where everything becomes, you know, one type of story item or that story item becomes, uh, you know, an important talking point. And I think Mackin is aware of this much earlier than many people are, though. Maybe as long as there's been news, this has been a problem in small communities. Right. And we should say, of course, Mackin does work as a professional journalist at this point. So this is kind of like, you know, an inside baseball type of of view of this, right? He knows exactly what he's talking about, but also this is how he makes his living. But he is looking at this with a, a real cynicism. And, and actually, that cynicism, I think, is going to come to the fore as we take this plot home. Right. Mackin tells us that he was really only obliquely paying attention to all of these rumors because of the fallout of the Bowman, which was his, quote, own mythical monster that is continuing to grow. And so because of all the pressure from work and the dealing with the fallout of writing the story, Mackin decides it's time to go to Manavan himself and take his own vacation. He needs a break from the hassle of this daily life. And the place, the beach town where he arrives, is just as he left it. He does say some odd things were about, like, you know, you might see a man in an odd white hat pass by and then later hear that a man wearing just such a hat had committed a murder not five minutes before. And Mackin's own son sometimes talks about the funny children that are in the village. But Mackin thinks that if there's any truth to these rumors... The key to unlocking that truth might be found with his friend, Morgan. Morgan is a Welshman, and he's described as a dreamer, and some people refer to him as a child who is both grown up and not yet grown up. There's a sort of fairy element to this Morgan character, I think. While Mackin was in Manavan, Morgan was spending some time in Castle Coke, and Morgan relays an experience he had to Mackin. One afternoon, Morgan is dozing, and he's opening his eyes every now and then just to watch the sea and the waves, and this is a sort of meditative state that he's in. And Morgan's meditation is broken by the sound of horrible, raucous cries, combined with the cries of lowly children. Morgan says that the sounds were to the ear what slime is to the touch. I love this description. It's fantastic. The children spoke foully, spouting off every filthy abomination of speech and blaspheming to boot. Morgan looks over the fort wall and he sees a swarm of children. These children are stunted creatures with old men's faces, with bloated faces and little sunken, leering eyes. Morgan sees blood running in streams as the children shriek with laughter. But later on, when he goes back to investigate, he can't find any evidence of their presence, not even blood on the grass. Yeah, these children or whatever they are, are really unsettling. And one of the things that, that Mackin is doing here that I find really fascinating, but also that just really works for me on an emotional level is that is that whatever these creatures are is a kind of perversion of the the landscape, right? A lot of times in weird fiction, when we get grotesque creatures like this, they're also in a grotesque setting. And we, we've gone as readers following our characters into uh, a horrific or a hideous setting, and then we get these hideous, horrific creatures as well. But here, these horrific creatures are in the middle of what is really the most beautiful landscape that you could ever encounter. And Mackin goes to great lengths, actually, to continuously describe how beautiful Wales is. And so in the backdrop of, of that, then, is something twisted and, and unsettling, something really uncanny. And, and that's something that really works for me in this story. Yeah, for me, too. By the time Mackin gets to this description of the children and, and Morgan's description of being a Castle Coke is also beautiful. 
the story is really picking up. My curiosity is peaked and I want to know more about what is going on and what Morgan saw in this dreamlike state, but we only have about three paragraphs left in the story. So we'll see what we can find out. Morgan is confused as anybody would be by this vision. So he asks his landlord, who is also the village postmaster about the children. And the man responds only cryptically. He says, the battle that is for ages unto ages and the people take delight in it. And when Morgan finishes telling Mackin this story, Mackin is reminded of the odd incidents involving children who wandered into sand dunes only to run back to their parents, screaming about funny children. And so Mackin, who is now ever the careful reporter and doesn't want to print anything without being overly cautious because of his mistake in printing the bowmen, writes to a doctor friend of his about this strange account that he hears from Morgan and his own experiences vacationing in Wales to see if the doctor has any thoughts. The doctor here seems to have solved this puzzle, for he writes, They were only visible, only audible, to children and the childlike. Hence, the explanation of what puzzled you at first— The rumors, how did they arise? They arose from nursery gossip, from scraps and odds and ends of half-articulate children's talk of horrors that they didn't understand, of words that shamed their nurses and their mothers. These little people of the earth rise up and rejoice in these times of ours, for they are glad, as the Welshman said, when they know that men follow their ways. And this is the end of the story. Yeah, what a cryptic ending. I I love how subtly Mackin introduces us to the idea that something unsettling or something weird really is going on in Wales. He uses this line, funny children was the phrase my little boy used. And I began to think they were funny indeed. But then he actually takes that away, right? He doesn't continue telling us about his son's encounter with the little people. Instead, he, he switches to tell us this story from uh, from uh, Morgan and then tells us yet another story even before he gets back to that. And so we're really left here at the end wondering what is actually going on. Like, what did Mackin's son see? Is Mackin convinced that there are weird, funny children with creepy grown-up faces on them actually running around in some of these seaside villages or countryside villages in Wales. It's all a real puzzle. It's not entirely clear. Mackin doesn't ever really come out and and lay his cards on the table in any kind of direct way, I guess. And so uh, I think that's really even going to lead into my first discussion question, which is I I have labeled here in the outline factual plot stuff, uh, which is to say... uh, Let's establish for ourselves before we go on whether we think that there really are mysterious, funny children doing awful things in the Welsh countryside. And if so, who or what are they? It's a really good question because of the way that Mackin sets up this story. As we talked about earlier, this story is written almost as a response to the Bowman, which was not which was written without any indication of falsity in it. And it was written in a time when a lot of people wanted to feel hopeful about the war, which was only supposed to last to last until Christmas and now has gone on almost a whole year. And I think in this story, we're seeing Mackin's own sense of the drawn out time table of World War One as it's taking place and the way it's not only wreaking havoc on the British countryside, but the way people are maybe not taking it so seriously, and that these uh, odd news items are maybe being reported on with the same level of importance as a battle that's taking place, or the number of wounded soldiers in a battle, or, or something like that. And so it's obviously the case that this story is not true, and he goes to great pains, I think, to cue his readers in to the fact that this isn't true, but these weird children are a stand-in for the effects that the war is having on Europe. I think the strangest thing that happens in this story, apart from the plot with the weird children, is this man with the odd white hat who commits a murder. And I don't know how that is tied into the whole bit with the with the funny children. Obviously, I don't think this man is child or childlike in any way. And so I, I wonder what 
I really wonder what Mackin is doing with that in this story. Because he says events like that are happening in Wales, but that's just a murder. So I'm really just... So it seems incongruous to me to have the theme of these rumors being paired with this odd report of a murder and all wrapped up in the ongoing war. I'm not sure what the connection between the man with the white hat and the little people is. They're clearly described very differently. I don't think that the man with the white hat is meant to also be one of the little people. So it seems like the the man in the white hat committing this murder is uh, maybe standing in uh, as a kind of uh, synecdoche, a kind of part for the whole of the fact that humans do awful things to each other, that all the awful things that happen in the world don't just have to be because there are fairies running around in the countryside right now, that we are perfectly capable of doing horrible things uh, to ourselves as well. I think maybe that's a, a good moment, uh, a good note on which to to try to get into some of the, talking about some of the meaning of this story. So the, the other question that I have here is, why are the little people coming out of the earth now in this moment, right? We get this final line of the the story that says the, the little people of the earth rise up and rejoice in these times of ours, for they are glad, as the Welshman said, when they know that men follow their ways. So in what way are humans following the ways of the little people now? I think the little people are clearly a perversion and a corruption of the innocent imagery of innocence imagery that is often tied to children, especially, you know, after William Blake, but even, you know, going on to Charles Dodgson or Lewis Carroll, who believed also deeply in the innocence of children and that this is a corruption of that image. And so it is only the children who are innocent, I think that's the implication here, who are able to see these creatures and the havoc they wreak. And I think why they are coming out of the earth now is because of World War One, obviously, and the way people are killing one another in this mechanized fashion, and the fact that there are people who are delighting in this war, whether it's for military glory or honor or to fight for their own way of life or freedoms or uh, whatever the reasons are, there is an element of pleasure that Mackin has maybe latched onto in the way that this war is being reported on and talked about, and it's ignoring all the horrors of the war. And meanwhile, the children who are left behind are being handed this world that is full of these new horrors. And I think that that is a lot of what the imagery of this story is caught up with. Yeah, I think that has to be it, right? The the men following their ways, uh, following the ways of the the little people, you know, has to has to be about the the violence of the war, right? The what we see of the little people in this story is that they are savage. They're they're horrifically savage. They're doing senseless violence to to people just for for pleasure. And this seems to be Mac and talking about the first world war in these same terms uh, a year into it not even a full year into it actually at this point uh, i guess about 11 months or 10 and a half months into the war at this point a war everyone thought would be over by christmas but that has gone on and on and has already taken so many lives and so there's a real implicit critique of the war here right what is the point of this war what for what purpose are we fighting what is the goal what's the agenda what are we trying to achieve and are we right? Are we good? Are we as a, are we as a as a country as the British Empire behaving with virtue here in 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 the midst of this war in this war? And I want to transition us into thinking about that question in the history of literature and in a particular type of literature, a tradition that Mackin is working with in here. Before we get there, though, I, I want to just uh, call attention to uh, something else in this line, uh, which is, for they are glad, as the Welshman said, when they know that men follow their ways. I just want to make sure that we're clear that the, the Welshman here is that postmaster character who tells Morgan that what is happening here is the battle that is for age unto ages and the people that is to say the little people take delight in it right so there is some 
cosmic battle that is happening here that the little people are the bad guys in, right? That they're the evil side in. And right now they're winning the battle because of our own poor behavior in our world. And I want to connect this with the Arthurian tradition uh, of uh, the high Middle Ages. And and this is something Mackin does explicitly in the text. There are actually two mentions of Avalon, the, the isle in the, the lake where King Arthur, uh, from which King Arthur gets some of his, his mystical power and uh, where he goes when he uh, is uh, is killed at the end of La Morte Arthur and, and in some of the other Arthur stories as well. Let me just catalog these these two mentions of Avalon for us since we, we didn't really talk about them in the, the recap. So, and I'll just read them. So here's the, the first. I felt that it could not be so, for the solemn rocks of Tremaine would have turned the liveliest Perot to stone. He would have frozen into a crag on the beach, and the seagulls would carry away his song and make it a lament by lonely, booming caverns that look on Avalon. And again, I think some more explicating needs to be done here because Perot is not a uh, a term that people are really using all that often anymore. But Perot is a clown character in Commedia dell'arte. And so what's happening here, right? This is Mackin saying that at this time, any happy song would be turned into a lament by the very nature of the place. Uh, and let me just give the, the second mention of Avalon here, and then we can talk a little bit about this. So the second one is this. Here came Morgan Daly, as he said, to dream of Avalon, to purge himself from the fuming corruption of the streets. So, Brenda, what do you, what do you think Mackin is doing here with these invocations of Avalon? Or at least what, what do you think is they, they, these two references have in common with each other? Well, I believe in the kind of Arthurian mythos that the king is supposed to return uh, King Arthur is when you know when London is at her, or when England is at her greatest need, and this this kind of the myth of the returning king is is an important feature of the King Arthur of the King Arthur tales, and so maybe part of the invocation of Avalon here is Mackin using British history and literary history to call that fact to mind that like they have lost their way, the the world has lost its way here. We are now in the way of the little people and not. And and we need the good king to return. And that is meant to orient the people towards what is right, what is good, what is just, the chivalric code. And so I think that that's part of what's going on. It's also important here, I think, that Morgan is the one who is looking out to Avalon to purge himself from the, the corruption of the streets. He is a picture of kind of masculine innocence. He's the grown-up version of the innocent child and he's good and people like him and so his it's his vision of england perhaps it's his vision of uh, the mythology we ought to be remembering about our past that we should key on to here instead of conjuring up these evil creatures to explain all the problems in our society yeah, Morgan, the character of Morgan himself here in this story is actually another reference to the Arthurian tradition. Uh, this is meant to make us think of Morgan Le Fay. And as you said in the recap, this Morgan is described as being kind of fairy-like, which is what this name Morgan Le Fay means. Uh, this is just another another clue for us to be thinking about the Arthurian tradition. Uh, you know, I'm really interested that you... you glommed on to the idea that the king will return, right? In the the nation's greatest need. Uh, Arthur is not the only character in literature like that, right? Charlemagne is one, Alexander the Great uh, frequently, and, and many others. What interests me about that reading of it is that that's a, a kind of optimistic reading. In fact, it's actually the same story as the Bowman, right? Which is to say that, that our heroes from our medieval past are going to return and help us out when we need them to do. That is the story that Mackin has told us in The Bowman in a, a hopeful, optimistic kind of rah-rah way. But I don't think that's actually what's going on in this story. This story is suffused with cynicism, cynicism about everything from journalism to the the virtue of the war and lawyers complaining about where they get to take their families on vacation while people are literally choking to death from gas attacks 
for them on their behalf, right? And so there's a real cynicism that is suffused here. And, and that's actually the tradition of Arthurian literature that I think Mackin is trying to invoke here. And this is this idea of the relationship between the virtue of the king and the peace and prosperity of the land. This is something that is all over uh, medieval political I- ideology, the ideology of medieval kingship. And this is something that appears in some Arthurian romances as the wasteland and the Fisher King aspect of the the classic grail quest the fisher king is is magically wounded and as a result his realm is also wounded and the land can only be healed if the king is also healed and the king can only be healed by the the holy grail and so the idea here right is that if something is wrong with the government then that wrongness will also pass to the land and i think that's what mackin is is pointing to here right with this idea that Something is wrong with the government, right? That uh, the government is not virtuous and therefore something is rotten with the land and these evil little people have arisen from it again and are behaving savagely. They're doing violence to actual humans because something is wrong with us and we need the only way to stop this is to heal the wound, to heal our virtue, which is to say to stop waging this senseless war. I think that's an excellent point, and it really speaks to the way that this story is a self-critique of the Bowman. It's almost taking it back, in a sense. Machin in this story, and it could be Machin the character or the man himself, is almost remorseful that he wrote this story that was about getting people excited about the war and the way it it caught fire with everybody. It it became printed everywhere. And I think this story is almost like an apology or a troll, as you said, where he's saying, I, that, that was a, a lark. That was a thoughtless thing. I wrote in a little bit of time and sent it out to get paid. I'm sorry it caught on this way, but this is not what the war is. And maybe this is a story. Maybe this is his way of, trying to put into print his own views on the war as it's dragging on. And we did not do this intentionally. I mean, for one, our our Patreon supporters selected this story for us to cover, but I've really gotten something out of covering these two stories in such close succession because it does seem like this story is yeah, taking back the Bowman in some way. And so what we have been able to witness ourselves really just over the course of uh, about a month is Mackin's own journey, the journey of Mackin's own response to the war from this uh, uncritical patriotism or really maybe even uncritical nationalist cheerleading to a cynical understanding or cynical reading of what the the war is, right? Is, uh, of, and that was really our big topic in The Bowman was in what way does this story feel or not feel like a First World War story? And of course, we came down on the side of this does not feel like First World War literature like Hemingway or Wilfred Owen or Robert Graves to us. But this story does just 10 months later. And that's amazing to have gotten to see that so clearly because of the random nature of how we're doing this podcast. Yeah, it is fantastic. And I'm also really glad that we read these stories close together because it's Shocking. I mean, this is a, a obviously the story written by a, a thoughtful person who realizes the effect that their words have on other people and is now trying to use them maybe in the hopes that he could wake people up to the horrors of the war as maybe he's got a, a closer view on it being in the newsroom, um, seeing reporters do what they do and journalists go and go to the trenches and <laughs> report on the, the terrible things that are happening. Well, I think that's an excellent note on which to, to bring this episode to a close. I'm Glenn McDorman. And I'm Brandon Buddha. As always, you can find us and our other creative projects at claytemplemedia.com. Head on over to the Clay Temple Forum and let us know what you thought of Out of the Earth. Uh, there were actually a lot more allusions to Arthurian literature than we got into here uh, on the episode. So, you know, we can have some fun on the forum, kind of pointing them out to each other, spotting them. I think that would be a lot of fun to do. And if you aren't already a supporter on Patreon, please check it out. You can get a lot of rewards, including access to, I guess it's about three dozen bonus episodes by now, and also the ability to have your say in what we cover on this show and also some of our others. 
And it's a huge help for us. It covers our costs and it helps us grow the network so we can turn around and do even more podcasts and more writing for you guys. Which we absolutely want to do. And I just want to thank everybody who's already supporting us. It really does help us out. Next time, we'll be reading The Velt by Ray Bradbury. But until then, we greet you and say farewell. <laughs>